This morning, the word of the Lord is going to come from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. I want you to focus upon verse 33, and then we're going to... Uh, I've worked with our technician, so we're going to have uh, the projection of scriptures on the screen. As we talk about this morning, returning to our first love. I want you to look at verse 33, where, Jesus, where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Amen. The sermon this morning is called Returning to Our First Love. Returning to Our First Love. The word love is one of the most strange words that we really don't understand. We use it very loosely and we sometimes become very confused as to what love is and how we are to love each other. If you listen to a lot of our music, our music has in it the themes of love. A lot of our songs that we listen to are talking about love in their different ways. Remember old song, What's Love Got to Do With It by Tina Turner? Well, she wrestles with this notion of the fact that love is, is not easy and love is sometimes very difficult. She wrestles with the notion of what love is. And so when we look at the biblical passages in the Bible, we see that Jesus was obsessed with teaching us about love. So we can go to John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 5 to 7, um, Maya. We're going to look at these three descriptions of love in the biblical text in John, chapter 5, chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. All right. All right. So we see here in John chapter 27, we see where Jesus asked his disciples three times, do you love me? But actually the word love, it has different translations. As we know, the New Testament was written in Greek and there are actually different, uh, three different translations of the word love. So when we go to John chapter 21, we see uh, in uh, verse number 7, and then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is I. And as soon as Peter heard this, it is the Lord. He wrapped the outer garments around him and he was taken out and jumped into the water. We actually need to go to... I'm going to look at it actually from the, from the biblical text. Where Jesus asked his disciples three times, do you love me? John chapter 21. We see in uh, starting at verse uh, 15, when they had finished calling, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And they answered, yes, Lord. He has said, you know that I love you. And Jesus answered, said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said to Simon of John, do you truly love me? Here is the word love being asked not only one time, but Two times. And he answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus answered, Take care of my sheep. And then he asks again, 
Do you love me? And we see in uh, verse 17, uh, Jesus, for the third time, asked Simon, the son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times. Jesus asked one person three times, do you love me? But actually, there are different translations for the word love in this, te this text. In John chapter 21, we see the notion to love as in three categories. We see love as the erotic sense of love, eros. And in that context, the word love is, is being described as a physical attraction. Do you love me? with eros, do you love me, with an erotic sensation, what we call in psychology the libido, libido energy. Is the libido energy speaking to love? That's the eros love. And then we have another translation of the word love here in the New Testament. The, word, the Greek word is phileo, which suggests that Jesus was asking Simon, do you love me like a friend? When you love someone like a friend, it means that you just have a, a deep interest in the person. You're, it's not an eros love, but it's a friendship love. And finally, Jesus gets to the deeper form of love, where Jesus asked Peter the third time, do you love me? And we see Peter answering the question and becoming frustrated with Jesus because Jesus asked him three times. So the third form of love is agapeo. Agapeo means, can you love me without restrictions? Can you love me unconditionally? Does your love have strings attached to it? Or is your love a love where you're going to love me even when I mess up, even when I make mistakes? That's the type of love that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, that we should have an agapeo love, not a love where we put strings attached and says, I will love you as long as you do this, as long as you do that, as long as you do that, then I will love you. But an agapeo love says, even when I don't follow the rules that you want, if you love me unconditionally, then that's the agapeo love. Martin Luther King Jr. said that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Then Dr. King said hate cannot drive out darkness. Only love can do that. Malcolm X is quoted as saying we need more light about each other. Light that creates understanding, understanding that creates love, love that creates patience, and patience that creates unity. So what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? To be a disciple of Christ means that we understand what it means to love God first, to have a relationship with God. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, you've got to have a deep relationship with with the one in whom you follow. You, you need to have a relationship with God. You need to have a relationship with your neighbor. You need to have a relationship with yourself. And you need to have a relationship with God. So love is about focusing, as Pastor Thinkson and I were talking this morning in the office, love is not about judging. Love is just about loving. Often our love is formulated in judging, where we judge people because people are different from us. But that's not really what love is all about. Love is embracing people and accepting people for who they are, respecting people who may be different, may come from different parts of the world. That love is the agapeo love that says, I'm going to love you, brother. I'm going to love you, sister. I'm going to love you because I am a disciple of Jesus. So my way, if you can put John chapter 3, verse 16 on the screen. We see this uh, verse. We should know this verse by heart. John 3, 16. If you don't know it by heart, you need to memorize this verse. Here it is. It says what? Let's read it together. For God so loved 
the world, everybody, that did, what, what did God do? God gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. So we see in the scripture here where it is referring to the essence of who God is. God is love. God is, is one who has been created to teach us how to love, how to respect people, regardless of where we come from. Then we need to look at John chapter 15, verse 13. Maya, if you can put that up on the screen. All right. John 15, verse 13. All right, we've been practicing this all week. Here it is. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you, right? That's, that's verse 3, Maya, what should be verse 13. 13, but okay. So in John chapter 15, we're going to do, do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to read it right from the scripture. John 15, verse 13 says, somebody want to read it for me? Go ahead. That's right. Greater love has no one than this, than to do what? Lay down his life for his friends. And if you go in John 15, go back to verse 9, it says, the Father has loved me, and I have loved you, and now I remain in my love. And if you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. We see the word love coming at us over and over again in the biblical text. So that means that we as disciples have two responsibilities. Number one, we must illuminate light. And in order for us to illuminate light, we have to love. Because when we love, we are illuminating the light of God. And the world that we're living in today is filled with darkness, filled with the darkness of hate. Hello, somebody. We're living in a mean-spirited world today that tells us that we must hate people because they're different than we are. But that is not the essence of what God has taught us. God has told us that we are to illuminate the light of Jesus Christ, which is love. Because if we don't have love, then we can do nothing. So what is love? So Maya, can you bring up 1 Corinthians chapter 13? What is love? What is love? We should know this scripture by heart. Paul begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to read the whole chapter. My wife, if you have it ready. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, what? I am a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. So if we don't have love, are we worth, are we really making an impact? No. We're just making noise because we don't have love. And so Paul goes on and he talks about the gift of prophecy. And he says, and can fathom all the mysteries and knowledge. But if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, there's the word love again. If I do not have love, I am what? Nothing. Nothing. If I give up all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to the hardships that I may boast, but I do not have love, what happens? I gain nothing. Love is, now we're going to find out how Paul defines what love is. You know, you know we read this scripture often at weddings, and I tremble when I'm reading this scripture because, you know, people are looking at each other in the eyes, and they're like, oh, I'm in love. But let me tell you, that love gets tested as you build a relationship with somebody. Hello, somebody. Love is hard work. So it tells us what is love. Love is patient. In other words, love is not selfish. Love focuses it, it, itself upon the other person. So a person who is, we call it in psychology, a person who is extremely narcissistic, where they think the world is all about me, myself, and I, 
cannot focus on loving someone else because they believe that the love should be all about them. But in reality, love is about giving it away to someone else. Love is patient. It takes a lot of patience when we love. Love is kind. Oh, my God, love is kind. It's getting real quiet out there. We're just doing some basic biblical studies here to look at how the Bible perceives this notion of love. Love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Hello, somebody. How many of us like to keep records of, I know people who can go back to 1941 and say, and they say, you did this on December 1st, 1941, and you're like, what? I'm moving on. I, I don't even remember what, what happened. But there's some people who, who have these laser minds where they remember exactly the date and the time that you hurt them. Hello, somebody. They keep records. They must have logs or something where they write in the log book, you did this on such and such a date, and I'm going to carry this all of my life. And you know, the problem with that type of love is that the person who hurts you doesn't even remember. And you're walking around with an attitude, with, a, with a, like, a, a, like, a scrow, like, a, what, like a groucho person holding on. Who are you hurting? You're hurting nobody but yourself. Hello, somebody. Because you're holding on. And there's so many people who are grudge holders. And next Sunday, we're going to be talking about forgiveness. When we learn how to forgive, we become free. Hallelujah. When we learn how to let it go. And, and you know, because all of us are imperfect people. You know, I, when I was younger, I thought I was going to meet a perfect person. Perfection does not exist. There is no such thing as a perfect person. All human beings are messed up, flawed. Hello, somebody. Got issues. We all got them, including me. But we have to still learn how to love. Maya, you, you disappeared with that. Bring it back up there, bro. Give Maya some love with a hand clap. Maya, we've been working on this all week long. All right, this is new. There's some of us who, who do this all the time, but uh, we worked on it this week. All right, so it says love protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. So now Paul is getting into all the gifts of the Spirit, and he's saying that all these things are going to fall away. Where there are tongues, they will be still, but where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We got some more verses. But when we, when completeness comes, what in part disappears? When I was a child. Oh my God, I could preach a whole bunch of sermons right there. A lot of us have been in church for years but we're still acting like a child. We're not growing up. The sign of discipleship is learning how to mature, learning how to put away childish things. Stop acting like a little kid when God wants you to grow up. When we are in Christ Jesus, we should always be growing, growing, growing. Coming to church every Sunday is a sign that we want to what? Grow. Every time we attend worship, we ought to leave worship with a changed attitude, a metamorphosis that happens where Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Behold, we have put away what? The old and we've put on the new. There should be a metamorphosis that happens every time we come into the presence of God. The question is, are you going through a metamorphosis or are you just going through the motions? A lot of us go through the motions of being a Christian, but there is no metamorphosis. There should be a change. 
When I became a man, I put away childish, I put the, the ways of childhood behind me. So we see here, here in the text on love, the notion that we should always grow. So the sermon is talking about, all right, we got more here. We say, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. And now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even when I am fully unknown. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But what is the greatest one? Love. The greatest of these is love. We're going to see this over and over and over again in the New Testament. We see Jesus teaching us to love people, not to judge people, not to put people down, not to discriminate. But we see in the New Testament this notion that we are to love. So the sermon is talking about returning to our first love. You can take it down, Maya. We're talking about returning to our first love. Is it possible, and this is what I was wrestling with in this sermon, is it possible that we can fall out of love with our first love? If our first love is God and should be God, is it possible to fall out of love with the one in whom was our first love? Yes. If we don't nurture that relationship, you know, that's really what love is about. Those of you who are in relationships know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, when you get married or you're in a relationship, the person looks like one way. And then when you get married, you start seeing, oh, my God, now I got to deal with all this stuff. Oh, ooh. you know, you start seeing the, the real person. The real person comes out. But you have said, I love you. And now you've got to deal with all these issues that come out in people, right? Because you're trying your best to practice as God taught us to love. So how do we deepen our love relationship with God? Number one, we, we experience uh, deepen our relationship with God through worship, 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 worship. Would you believe that worship is about love too? How can you worship God when you're not deepening your relationship with God? You know, a lot of us worship God, but we, we, we you know, because our relationship with God is so alien and distant, worship becomes very dour. It doesn't have any feeling. It has no emotion to it because we are not in love with the God in whom we're supposed to love. When we worship, there ought to be some smiles on your faces. When you worship, there ought to be some joy because you're worshiping God. And you remember back when I did the teachings over the summer about the, they that worship God must do what? Worship God in what? In spirit and in truth because God is a spirit. So when we worship God, we got to worship God in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God when you're holding a lot of shackles and a lot of bondage, a lot of hate and meanness. You've got to let that stuff go so that you can worship, worship God. Because the song Carol was just presenting to us about, what was the song called? God makes us free. He set us free. If God has set us free then we can worship. Number two, not only, must, not only must there be worship, number two, part of, of returning to our first love is to experience the koinia. The koinia. The koinia is a, a fancy Greek word which, which means the gathering together of the saints. When we come together, you know, I, you know there are some people who feel like they don't need to to worship God with anybody but just themselves. But I have a problem with that type of worship. I need to be with people who have the same spirit that I have so that when I worship, I'm worshiping with not only myself, but I'm worshiping with others who love God also. That's what we're doing right now on Sunday morning. We're worshiping with the koinia. 
We're worshiping with those who also love God. The koinia, number three, part of our love for God is to study the word. This scripture in Matthew 6 talks about worrying, talks about how we worry about our clothes and we worry about everything else. And then verse 33 says, stop worrying and do what? Seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So that means we've all, when we talk about our our love, we've got to stay focused on the one in whom we love. And the focus is God. Let me tell you, the world we live in today, it's hard to stay focused. This is what makes Christmas one of the funkiest holidays of of the year because Christmas has a whole lot of symbols that have nothing to really do with the true meaning of Christmas. We got a lot of symbols at Christmas. We got a lot of distractions of other things that make us feel a certain way. But Christmas is really about the coming of the Messiah, the Meshua, the Christ-born child that was in Bethlehem. And if we could just focus on that, maybe our Christmases would be a lot more happier. But because we focus on all this other stuff, you know, the stores or Singing the music. I was in a store yesterday. It had all kinds of Christmas music going on. The music was saying, come in and buy, 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 buy. (laughs) Spend money. That's what Christmas is about. I want you to spend, go in your pocket and get those credit cards out and buy gifts. Only to find out that Christmas is more than that. Christmas is about the gift of a baby, the baby Jesus that was born in Bethlehem. If we could just return to our first love and recognize that Christmas is about the baby Jesus. I've given you three points, worship, koinia. Number three, study the word. Now I'm going to give you another word, and it's right there in the text in Matthew chapter 6. The word is prayer and fasting. If we love God, we've we've got to spend more time in praying and fasting. If you you look at Matthew 6, so you don't think I'm making this up, just go right back to the text. In Matthew 6, Jesus gives us long, detailed information. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen. And I tell you the truth, that when they receive their reward, but when you pray, do what? Go into your secret closet. Go into your secret closet and pray to God. You cannot experience the true essence of the love of God and you're not spending time in prayer and fasting. As a matter of fact, Prayer and fasting is a reflection of your love for God. The more you pray, the more you're learning to deepen your relationship with God. Number five, loving God means to be doers of the word. Doers of the word. Faith without works is dead, according to the book of James. That God has called us to be doers of the word. We, we've got to practice what we preach. If we say we love God, then we've got, to, we've got to practice it. We've got to learn how to love other people. We've got to learn how to go into all the world and spread the love of God to everyone. Because that's the mandate of what God wants us to do. Love, not judge, love. Love people. Finally, Love is about seeking justice. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, what does the Lord require of me? And the book of Micah says, the Lord requires that we love mercy, that we love justice. And then what else are we supposed to do? We're supposed to walk humbly before God. Right? The first love is God. 
Matthew 6, 33. And some of the words that I use for love are all in the, in the uh, letters R. Here are some of the R's I see. I don't think you have it, Maya, Maya for the PowerPoint. Some of the words for R is refocus. Refocus. The second word is reimagining. When we learn how to love, we learn how to refocus. We also learn how to reimagine. But we also learn how to reinvent. These are all what I call the R's of love. Refocus, reimagining, reinventing, rekindling, rethinking, recreating, refreshing, relationships, and returning and renewing. Maya, do you have an image of a heart of love? You don't have that? No? All right. So in conclusion, we're going to listen to a song called Falling in Love with Jesus by Jonathan Butler from South Africa who wrote this beautiful song, Falling in Love with Jesus. You have it ready for the PowerPoint, Myla? Okay. With Jesus Falling in love 